hey, so I've never really done content like this before. I usually just kind of stream and that's that, or I type up something about something I like and that's that. But oh, there's so much going on in my D&D campaign. This, I mean, this one recording session is probably going to be split into multiple pieces anyway. Uh, but I just kind of want to nerd out to a camera, talk to the void. Maybe a couple of friends will watch this. That's not the point. I just need a, an outlet for this. So, the the world that um, that my D&D campaign takes place in is one that I've been writing in for a while. Um, why is that line there? I'm sorry, I get distracted easily. And um, I just kind of, you know, the world had already been named, I've been writing in it for a while, so I know a good section of a chunk of its history. And I was like, well, I mean, at that point, it's not that difficult to adapt it into D&D. Um, just threw in magic, added in this event in history that made it like a high, like made it on its way to a high magic setting. I describe it as like medium magic, where functionally it's high magic, but the world's not used to that yet. Uh, and I put together this map with colored pencils and a dream. Don't judge me. <laughs> and that was that was pretty much it. Um, I put together some ideas for stuff. You know, like um, I'd never. In my writing, I'd never really, like, messed with the idea of a pantheon before. Religion isn't something that I really ever intended to touch on when I was writing. But D&D requires it for things like paladins and clerics, and it, like, helps add a good layer to culture. So I was like, okay, well, what do I want to do? I decided, you know, I don't really want to just, like, take the normal D&D thing if I'm homebrewing. Like, um, I can't remember names, but, like, stuff that you'd see in the... Uh, like DM's guide or player handbook, whatever. I decided not to use that. I decided not to use another pantheon. And I was like, dragons are awesome. So I decided that ancient dragons were removed from the life cycle of other dragons, and um, you just have so you just have a wormling, a young dragon, an adult dragon. They die. My ancient dragons are considered gods. They are immortal. They have been around for eons, and. In the background, they, I have certain, I call them my draconic pacts, restricting their actions to a certain degree because of other things that are very spoilery. So if my party watches this, I'm not really going to go into that for this video. Um, but I pretty much gave them a doc, the document that's right up here, which is um, a request from the current general at that time period in Tempara, saying, we have a big amount of money for whatever group proves that they're worthy of taking on this big task. Did not say anything else about that, put out some things like, um, like this, uh, these lines right here are basically, hey, don't be a dick. Uh, kind of fishing for good aligned people, but as I've explained, or as I will explain at another point in time, politicians never mean what they say, so that was like, halfway me hoping that people rolled good or decided to play good aligned characters and weren't complete assholes it didn't work we'll get to that in a minute but i gave them that and i gave them a document right here which is just the history of tempara in the last really just in the last 50 years and we kind of just started um so what we what we decided on um, was that they did want to they did want to go for the contract which was going to be given out here in Darshan and I decided to have everybody start here in Laoma. Uh, it's two weeks travel by foot. Um, my things are marked like you see seven because they ended up getting a carriage to take them, but they just kind of did some normal job hunting, regular mercenary stuff. Um, hit level three on the way to Darshan, uh, made some interesting allies. Well. No, they didn't make any allies. They just made some enemies along the way uh, in this group um, led by an Asmar paladin named Caden, who's uh, quite the hothead. And that was that. Uh, so that's... Since then, like, they've headed down to um, the budding Fort Harnock uh, in order to try to get some information about men who were driven insane after some random encounter that happened um, and caused the military to think it was severe enough to start building a fort, and they just arrived at Fort Odoblo after last session. But as for the, the party themselves, you have Maz Morsing, my biggest troublemaker. He's, um, he's using the, the uh, from the Unearthed Arcana psionics. He is a, uh, an aberrant mind psionic sorcerer. Um, 
really, really good intelligence, really good stats overall, frankly, and um, kind of a sociopath. His whole deal is that he was orphaned and kind of just figured out how to do stuff on his own, relied on his psychic powers to an extreme degree to the point that he rarely talks and mostly uses them to intimidate people, uh, which keeps on working well because it's a media magic setting. Uh, though, you know, as I start, you know, as people start having repeated interactions with him and he hits a higher level to the point that he's known uh, any important player like at this point isn't really going to be that surprised by this they're just going to hold a conversation with him uh though usually responding out loud to try to make him use his voice because come on just come on um we then have tiss who is our um our cleric uh, she's our life cleric she's a tiefling uh, i just i normally just refer to her as a haughty thoughty because that's kind of her whole shtick she flirts with anybody and everybody because she can um really fun character she used to be um the leader of a pirate crew so she's got like some interesting ties and will like gladly take money from people uh like she helped out maz killing some people in the last session which was something definitely that's gonna happen for another video but it's just like hey it's a way of getting money that's just kind of how she lives and then they're like on the evil spectrum, I guess, and more on the good side of things, you have uh, Radiant Star, who's a tabaxi ranger. Um, again, uh, uh, UA revised ranger, not the not the revisions that are in Tasha's, because we started this before Tasha's came out. Um, and she's like, she's a really interesting character because she obviously cares a lot about other people, but she doesn't know how to show it. She's just kind of vain and like an airhead. Um, she idolizes a couple of people behind the scenes, but you don't re they haven't really gotten to see that yet. So she's mostly just kind of doing her own thing and whatever she thinks is right. And uh, Ryu is um, a homebrew race called a Tamarinian. Uh, he's a monk. And uh, the original document for Tamarinians was like, well, hey, they want to um, go on these on these journeys to like prove themselves as a... a it's like a rite of passage uh, amongst Tamarinians. And he was given a bigger one in hopes that, you know, one day he might be the next leader of the village or something important like that. So he was tasked with, for better or worse, helping in a meaningful way to change a country's, uh, the course of country's history. Uh, so that is what drove all of them to come together, two of them for money, uh, one of them for recognition, one of them for the sake of his... Um, for the sake of his rite of passage. And that's that's just how they got together. Like I said, I kind of outlined what they did, but the journey along the way was really interesting because there there were like some budding moments um on their first like two levels where it was like, wow, this looks like it could start conflict between them. But then um one of Ryu's character flaws is that he hates being called a monkey. So people called him a monkey naturally. I, as the DM, decided nobody knows that. They're just going to call him a monkey because what the hell is a Tamarinian? Um, so over time, he like he had like like anime moments where he just like you know his eyes darken and he's just like, "Well, what'd you say to me? Whatever." So I was like, you know, your strength doesn't match it, but I'm gonna say you can take barbar a level in barbarian. So you can have the bigger hit die, you can have the rage function, it works well if you just, like, it works well from a narrative standpoint. And that's a lot of, like, my DMing styles. If it was going to work well from a narrative standpoint, screw the book. Um, so that was, so that happened. And immediately afterward, when they were in Darsh again, um, it was only their group and the one led by that aforementioned Asmar Paladin, Caden. Um, who they didn't like just because Maz had started crap between them and Caden being a hothead never took the chance to actually talk to them. And when they fought, she, of course, called him a monkey, uh, trying to get a rise out of him, and he decided to kill her. I had a cleric on hand with her revivify, so that wasn't, like, a problem uh, if I decide to use them behind the scenes. But it was a really interesting moment for Ryu. Because Ryu's been this good aligned, like, kind of naive, but really, like, jovial character. And then he killed somebody in cold blood. That was not threatening his life, because the battle was supposed to be exclusively non-lethal. So it was very much... 
turbulent for him. And then a little bit later, Maz went ahead and he um, he popped into Ryu's mind in a later fight and said, that guy just called you a monkey. It was a complete lie. Where you figured out that it was a complete lie very quickly. And he didn't like that, obviously. He doesn't like the fact that he was being used. Uh, so as a result of that, he developed this grudge against Maz. Uh, and that grudge against Maz has been a driving thing of the last several sessions, honestly. It's been a little bit now. Um, but, like, it seems like uh, the player, Griffin, wants his character Ryu to stay on this good aligned side, but at the same time, like, Maz is kind of chipping away at that. Um, eventually he may break through and Ryu might have a... Uh, you know, an informal alignment change. I don't think, like, alignment static or anything. It's just a general idea of how they prefer to act. So that was that's all been very interesting. And then um, you have the fact also that I gave... I gave, in Darshayen, a magic item to one of our partners... To our party members, actually. Maz got something from my Emerald God, who's known as the Governor of the Mind, because he's really interested in psionics right now, and Maz, and Maz agreed to help him out. But the item that I gave to Radiant is known as the Silver Dragon Blade. Now, uh, behind the scenes, if you look at my world's history, uh, I use Matt Colville, or well, MCDMs, I guess, um, Gemstone Dragons also in my world. So there are 15 Draconic Gods. And each of them, at some point in history, went ahead and, ha with the help of you know, one of the best blacksmiths and one of the best sorcerers of the time went ahead and had their blood infused into a sword of legendary make. Only one of these swords can, or only one sword exists for each dragon. Only one sword can exist for each dragon. I have tiered attunement for them, so like, Radiant did one quick thing, and all of a sudden the weapon's like, okay, well you prefer fighting with two short swords, right? It became two short swords for her. She then, um, formed more of a, like, she got an idea constantly of what the dragon blades were feeling, and now it's a plus one weapon, and she has a constant idea of what it's feeling. And behind the scenes, the idea for this is that I wanted it to feel like this thing's strong, but it takes a while to warm up to you. She's had it for a while now. Um, excuse me, she got it at the beginning of level three there, a little bit through level four right now, and it's just got it just hit plus one, which I know is strong for level four. Um, it's one of the only two magic items the party currently has for a reason, and she does a lot of damage. I promise. So, as things have kept as things have uh, kept moving along, Radiant's been noticing more and more of like just the fact that Maz does his own thing. He's a criminal. He's not socially adjusted, and recently, I guess this isn't going to be in a different video if I just keep rambling at the rate that I am. I will have a different video for background stuff, so this video is officially approved for my party members. Um, so as things kept moving along, they went down to the Azana Desert, like I said, the budding, Harnock, the budding Fort Harnock, to um, look into men who'd been driven insane during an encounter. And Maz got a lot of information out of them. And then he killed them. But the fourth one, he didn't kill. He didn't kill it him soon enough for him not to be able to cry out for somebody. Because, you know, people were around the tent, but there was nobody else in there with him within earshot. So they were just going to assume, oh, you know, like, yeah, they were driven insane by the by being forced to recall this but hopefully Maz got enough information that their sacrifices weren't in vain they were just they'd just been in sick bed like in the sick ward for a while so Maz instead puts stab wounds in all four of them set, uh, puts the knife back in the first dude's hand and says he killed three of them I killed him in response all of them died of stab wounds like this. He then went ahead and made up a story for why that happened. Which I thought was really clever. Like, it was super on the fly. Maz came up with a story. And he said that whatever it was that they ran into had placed some sort of a, a curse, I'll say, on them. 
and it was controlling them. And that's why that guy attacked. Which sounds really good if you don't know anything about this. And if you don't know anything about Maz. I would not give that a second thought if I were a soldier in that position. However, my NPCs are not all soldiers in that position. So there may be something that comes of that in the near future. Though I won't say anything about it. Because, again, this video is okay for my party. And I don't want to spoil anything for them. So he comes up with that story on the fly. Everybody buys it. It was a really good lie from him, I have to admit. And they left. And they went all the way back up. Um, let me get this ruler. Okay, perfect. So they went all the way back up from Fort Harnock to Fort Arlos. Um, in for, once at Fort Arlos, she was like, uh, she. I'm sorry, I say she because the player's she. Maz himself is a he, so if I mix pronouns, I'm thinking of player instead of character. Or vice versa. So Maz, uh, once at Fort Argos, only then did he actually go ahead and give the uh, his his report to somebody to deliver to Darshayen because he needed to keep his lie accurate. If he thought that there are people down in Fort Harnock who, who had been possessed, who's to say all of them weren't? In which case, it would have never reached Darshayen. Again, great lie. Very, very well thought out. They went to Aoma. They found out that the adventurers who had initially helped them had... Uh, that it disappeared in the Fovic Hill Forests have still not been found. That is a side quest that they will be able to take up later if they want to. But, um, informally, I'm not allowing them to take it below level 5. Since they're only level 4 right now, they're going to have to continue with, like, mainline stuff or something else uh, before they can go ahead and do that. From Laoma, they went to Fort Odablo, which is where they just reached. However, there was an interesting occurrence right around here. With, uh, with, oh, I'm on my wrong monitor because I'm silly. Right around here, there was an interesting occurrence. As three, um, griffins attacked, not a big deal for a level four party, not a big deal for a good level four party, which they're, they're good in the damage department and their AC is not terrible. So if they can dictate terms of battle, which they can decently against griffins, it wasn't going to be a big deal. Also, griffins are not very intelligent creatures, and I don't have not very intelligent creatures that don't get pack tactics abuse um, abuse uh, flanking for advantage because I don't think it is something that they're, like, capable of understanding. I go off of their stats for soft things like... their soft stats for things like that quite a lot. But as, as the griffins start attacking, Maz basically says to um, Tiss... Now's the time. Let's get them. And starts attacking their carriage drivers. Which is interesting for two reasons. The first reason is that these guys had done nothing against them ever. The second one is that Maz had specifically requested that the people who escort them around, um, which the military did agree to hire out for them, he specifically requested that those people be able to defend for themselves. So... This is all, that information is all that the party had. These guys didn't interact with them that much. They were friendly to what extent they could be. Uh, party was a little bit standoffish because of emotions running high, so they kind of took a backseat, did what they were supposed to, um, avoided avoided engaging in encounters, and just basically just focused on taking the dodge action. I didn't even have them on the map because I knew they weren't going to be fighting. So Maz attacks them, and Tiss joins, and they kill them both. And... In the aftermath of the fight uh, was actually one of my favorite moments ever as a dungeon master. Because I just went around to each individual character and I said, how do you feel about what just happened? How do you feel about what just happened? And then afterward I said, do any of you talk to one another about what just happened? And I'm just asking simple questions. They could be yes or no. They can go into as much or as little detail as they want to. And they got into character, and it was great, as they had legitimate discussions about this. And they agreed, you know, let's put it off until the morning. Our emotions are running high right now. Great decision. I completely respect it. They agreed to stay together and protect each other because they've been traveling together for so long, and they were under this contract together. So even if they didn't personally like each other in that moment, they weren't going to screw each other over. Really, really good decision, in my opinion. Um, Ryu and... Uh, Radiant were rightfully indignant over uh, the killing of Ro or the unnecessary killing of those two carriage drivers, Roran and Sloan. Um, especially when they saw that Tiss and Maz just split up the gold that the two of them had on them, uh, that Roran and Sloan had on them afterward, and it was just business for them. 
So they spoke, they, they talked it over. And what, uh, what Radiant and Ryu basically said was, I get that you were just doing this for money, but there's no way that I approve of it. Stay away from me. And Radiant's a very outgoing person, so I don't know if the full weight of this was picked up by the player, by the other players. But Radiant is very outgoing, very. It's modeled after uh, the character, the player's own cat, Koneko, and she's just like, "Well, pet me." So the character's like, "Well, pet me. I'm amazing, right?" So the fact that she says, "Get away from me! Like, don't touch me! Don't pet me! Whatever!" Like, that's. That's a big sign of aggression from Radiant. Um, and it's actually to the point that um, because Maz is, like, grating against the rest of the party so much, like, Dev, the player, willing to play a different character instead. Um, they don't have, like, huge issues with Tiss because Tiss was more, like, an, an accomplice to this. She didn't mastermind it. She has shown that she has amounts of empathy. So... She should be able to stay. And uh, players have thought about things and said, yeah, you know, even after this job, I think that my characters are able to justify staying together as a party. But it's still very tense right now. Ryu was just starting to lighten up toward Maz some, and then he did something that completely uh, betrayed his trust. Radiant is aligning herself with this lawful good weapon. And then this sort of thing happens. And now with her reaction uh, earlier than I anticipated, I did end up giving her plus one because I thought this was super good for uh, my silver dragon. Like, it's super close to what it would approve of because the attunement with the weapon is based on doing things that the weapon, thus the dragon, would approve of. So overall, it's been, like, really interesting thus far. And I think that my, my characters themselves, uh, the players have all thought about, like, all have, they're all really good at getting into character and have a good idea of what all of their characters want and need and like just kind of what makes them tick so I'm really interested to see what happens in the near future as um, they're going to in Fort Odablo discover what the deal is with this dragon that they're well perhaps I should say because this is going to depend on how good their question their question asking is they're going to find out what the deal is with this dragon that has been attacking Fort Odoblo and is uh, the source of their contract which they have been told to take care of not necessarily eliminate by any means necessary they'll travel up into the Par the Ver ah, I don't know why I started on that the Verpar mountains and they will find it they will handle it however they handle it and there is a dungeon waiting for them afterward, which is known and not a spoiler. But that's about, like, by way of background, where this party stands, uh, a little bit of what makes each of them tick, a little bit of what each of them do. Uh, and I think I'm going to call this first video from the session at that point, because the other one is spoilers, spoiler ridden, I should say, and I don't really want my party hearing about it. But if they're interested in this and my thoughts on them, they're more than willing to watch this. So that's about it for my first unofficial campaign diary, I suppose. Um, it's good to talk about. Help me organize thoughts a lot, but all good things must come to an end.